Hello everyone again. Uh, welcome to the webinar series on introduction to geostationary air quality observations. Uh, in this three session series, uh, we will today learn about uh, geostationary air quality observations, some of the data sets uh, and tools, how to access those data sets. So like I said, this is a three session, three part uh, webinar series. Uh, part one today we'll do, uh, I will do, and my name is Pawan Gupta. I'm senior scientist here at USR at Marshall Swiss Flight Center. And later on, uh, Aaron, Dr. Aaron Neger will join me. He is also scientist here at UAH at NASA Marshall. He will talk about the upcoming TEMPO mission. In part two, we have our guest speakers, uh, Dr. Emmy Huff from NOAA. She will talk about the air quality products from the GOES-R series of sensor, which includes GOES-East, GOES-West, and most recently launched GOES-18. In part three, which will be on October 25, we will have a discussion on air quality data sets coming out from the very new instrument called GEMS, uh, launched by South Korea. Uh, and we will have Dr. Sujun Go uh, from UMBC and NASA's Goddard Swiss Flight Center. She will talk about GEMS products and how to access and will uh, walk through some of the Python scripts to uh, read and map the GEMS data. So for today's talk, uh, uh, so I was talking about the learning objective for today's uh, presentation. So we'll go over the geostationary orbit we'll talk about the difference between the low earth orbit and geostationary then we'll look into some of the imageries how to access them and then finally aaron will come in and we'll talk about the tempo mission okay so before going to forward i would like to quickly do a quick uh, survey question here uh, just want to get understanding uh, where we are in terms of uh, using the geostation satellite data from the audience so just to you will see a pop-up question on your screen and you will have about 30 seconds to respond to these questions and that that is just to give me an idea uh, how should i pace hold the training and where we stand before we start the training so if you can just take a few seconds to respond to the question uh, we have only 6% people voted so far, so please vote if you can. Okay, that's good. We have about 70% voting. I'm going to close the poll in two seconds and then uh, here are the results. So that is good that most people who use who have uh, or who are attending today have used the satellite data in one way or another way uh, which is good because this is a intermediate level webinar series and where we are trying to actually now let me ask you the follow-up question if you ever used any geostation satellite data for any purpose so we got about 70 percent polling so i'm going to close the and share the results so we have about half of division among the participant who have used geostationary or not used. So this is good, thank you. Uh, so let me get back to the presentation. What I'm going to do is since we have uh, about half half, I'm going to review some of the uh, key aspects of remote sensing, okay? And let me start with first one. So one of the thing which is very different in geostationary is where the sensor is located, right? So these are all different types of uh, remote sensing sensors, which makes uh, different kinds of measurements or used for different purposes, right? Uh, on Y axis, you see a vertical uh, level in the atmosphere we, where these type of sensors or instruments are typically deployed. So you have a lot of sensors on the ground, you have aircrafts, UAVs, balloons in low troposphere or atmospheres. And then once you go about 400 kilometer up, you start looking a lot of satellites which are um, making low Earth orbit, orbit uh, measurements. So uh, International Space Station is around 400 kilometers. 
and then you have around seven eight hundred kilometer all the terra aqua modest sensors are sitting there when you go to thirty six thousand kilometer that's where the geostationary or geosynchronous satellites uh, are typically operated typically these satellites are meteorological satellite but uh, more recently uh, we have been using them for the air quality purpose as well okay so this is again a very basic uh, representation of how the whole satellite remote sensing works so you have a satellite in the space either it can be a low earth orbiting or a geostationary satellite so depending on the orbit it will have a different height in the atmosphere or in this space and then you have a sun solar uh, the source of energy so sun's radiation comes to the earth uh, in different wavelength we will see about that and then it actually interact with the atmospheres all the components in that atmosphere like clouds aerosol particles gases water vapors everything which is in the atmosphere and some of them get reflected back to the space some of that get transmitted to the surface and then it interact back uh, with the objects which are on earth surfaces which includes uh, trees water grass bare soils you know build up any kind of built up area any kind of human area so when solar radiation interact with atmospheric particles in the atmosphere depending on the particles properties it will actually attenuate the radiation will attenuate in a specific wavelength and what satellite is going to measure is what is going back to the space so whatever is going back to the space is measured by the satellite so this is called top of the atmosphere radiance measurement so what satellite actually measure it does not directly measure the amount of pollutions or type of vegetation or height of the building or uh, number of trees but it measures how the radiation is changed when it was coming from the sun to going back to the space by interaction so the radiation will change according to the property of the object through which it is interacting so that change in radiation is measured by the satellite and that is what we are going to use to retrieve information about that particular objects or get information about those particles in the atmosphere now i talked about the uh, earth uh, the solar radiation the solar radiation is nothing but electromagnetic radiation spectra right it has a range of wavelength uh, in which the solar radiation comes to the earth and what you see here are that range of electromagnetic spectrum so you start with radio waves microwave these are longer wavelength radiation and you can see a comparable size uh, on the bottom here but as you go towards infrared visible the wavelength start decreasing in size then you have all the way ultraviolet x-ray income for air quality application most of our work is actually limited to visible and in some ultraviolet so when aaron talks about the tempo mission he will talk about the ultraviolet wavelengths uh, when i'm talking about the visible and then uh, we will have another presentation in week two most of the aerosols information we rely on the visual part of solar spectrum we do use infrared part of solar spectrum as well to uh, help remove the clouds and other features in the satellite imagery so infrared visible and ultraviolet these are the main range of solar spectrum in which we are working and that's where we are actually getting our most of the information okay so let's move on and look at the some satellite sensors and how so often in the community satellites and sensors and instruments are used uh, interchangeably but there is a basic difference uh, between them uh, the satellites are nothing but the platforms or the bus on which all the instruments are mounted and the instrument and sensors are individual sensors which are making measurements so for example this particular picture is for GOES R spacecraft or GOES 16 spacecraft and now you can see um, it has uh, solar panels and these are all the uh, platform on which individual sensors are mounted and you can see there are multiple sensors uh, two over here's two over here's and then you have a most common which we often use are abi advanced baseline imager that is what we are going to use for a quality application and the glm for global lightning 
uh, monitoring purpose. So this is for mo mo lightning uh, monitoring. So the satellites which we will talk throughout this webinar series uh, are uh, GOES R series uh, that include GOES R and GOES S and GOES T, which has been recently launched few months back only. Now the way naming convention works of this GST satellite is a little bit different than uh, some of the polar orbiting which we have seen. And this is specifically true for the NOAA operated satellite, which is GOES series. Uh, so before launch, they are denoted by these letters, R as the recent one was T. After the satellite is launched, they are named as numbers, GOES 16, GOES R become GOES 16, GOES S become 18 goes T will become uh, became goes 18, uh, which is currently in orbit. Once they are operational, means operational means satellite becomes operational even when they are goes uh, numbered. But once they become operational and adopted into the data stream and user applications, NOAA declare them operational satellite, and then they become either goes east and goes west. So there are currently goes 16 which is goes east and goes 17 which is goes west the goes 18 satellite which was launched very recently will replace goes 17 uh, in few months and become goes west so goes 17 will be parked in another position it has some issues in some of the channels so that is the reason it will be replaced and we will learn about these two more uh, in the part two when we talk about specific product from these two satellites mm -hmm. Okay, so the common orbits, uh, there are two types of common orbits through which most of the air quality observations are uh, achieved. Uh, polar orbit, which we have looked in many different trainings, uh, MODIS, MISERS, VIRS, OMI, TROPOMI, all of these sensors are in this polar orbiting satellites, okay? So they have global coverage, but they only rotate around the poles and they only makes measurements one or two measurements per day. And typically, their overpass time is same according to the low, local solar time. Whereas the geostationary satellite orbit is fixed, actually, the geosynchronous satellite orbit is fixed about 36,000 kilometers above the Earth. It has the same rotation period as well. So because of that prop specific property, uh, it can actually see the same portion of Earth all the time. So you get a limited coverage over a specific region, but you get frequent observe, you get capability to make measurement uh, very frequently on that particular place. So, so the basic difference between polar orbiting is global coverage versus regional coverage. Polar orbiting only gives you one measurement per day, whereas the geostationary gives you multiple measurements per day. Here are some more facts about the geostationary uh, orbits. Um, again, uh, the height from the Earth is about 36,000 kilometer. The orbital velocity is there. The orbit is circular with zero degree inclination, and I'll talk about that inclination in a little bit more. Uh, and this basically allows satellite to match Earth rotation period. And that is the main basic characteristic of a geostationary orbit. So you might also heard this term called geosynchronous and geostationary, sometimes people think they are same, but basically, typically the term geosynchronous used for any satellite, which is about 36,000 kilometer in different orbits. And now you can imagine there can be different orbits even at that same height because Earth is uh, spherical, so you can rotate your satellite from different angles with respect to equator. So the geostationary orbit is a special type of orbit which is located on the equator. So the inclination angle with respect to the uh, uh, equator is zero degree in case of geostationary. There are other type of geosynchronous satellite which are inclined with certain angles for different purposes. Uh, some of the common communication satellites are also located in the geosynchronous orbit. Uh, most of the meteorological satellite historically has been in the geostationary orbit so that you can actually monitor uh, weather pattern uh, with high frequency of the data, especially during storms, hurricanes, uh, wind storms, and things like that. 
Okay, so let's move on. Uh, this we already kind of uh, looked over, but just give you a more animated view of how a polar orbiting or LEO orbit satellite. So in this case, this is a MODIS orbit uh, making measurement during daytime. Uh, when there is a dark night time, the visual data is not available. So you see how the polar orbiting is making measurement throughout the day, scanning different part of the earth during different time of the day, right? So this is how the polar orbiting making global coverage. Whereas the geostationary you have, this is a five, uh, 10 minute data from goes um, east, where you can see that it's making every 10 minute full disk measurements. Um, and, but the, the, the area which it is covering is fixed every time. Uh, the darker color you see is a night time and then the, uh, this uh, visual part is uh, daytime. And you will see very specific differences in features between geostationary and polar orbit. And we'll talk more a little bit uh, later on when we start looking the uh, true color images. Okay, so here is another example uh, why we need uh, geostationary observation. So this is just showing a PM 2.5 dynal pattern. And these are average for uh, different season, different color represent different season. On, on X axis, you see different time of the day. And you will see in many, many places or most places, you will see there is some kind of a dynal cycle in observed PM2.5 concentration or particle mass concentration. And this dynal cycle can be related to the emissions, change in emission. For example, in urban areas or cities, if there are traffic hours, then you will see this kind of issue when there are high concentration of pollution during the traffic hours and with low during the uh, non uh, less busy time. There can metrology, which can also actually change this dynamic cycles. For example, the boundary layer height can uh, significantly modulate the dynamic cycle of PM2.5. So those are some of the things which we have to take care um, when we are making PM2.5 measurements. Uh, we need that information. And the polar orbiting, which I showed earlier, has only one or two measurement. If you combine multiple instruments, then you can get multiple measurements. So those measurements are um, not going to actually give this detailed dynamic cycle information. That is why you need geostation satellite. So the current geostation satellite uh, have capabilities to make uh, measurement as frequently as every 30 seconds for limited areas uh, to the 60 minute. And some of the example which have been, I was telling earlier are the ABI advanced baseline imager, uh, advanced uh, Himawari imagers, uh, advanced meteorological imagers. These are basically same sensors operated by different space agencies, uh, HI by Japanese, uh, AMI by Korean space agency, and the GEMS is also from Korean space agency, specifically designed to do air quality monitoring. Um, we will have a Tempo and Sentinel-4, uh, which will form a constellation of satellite, which will learn more about this in uh, later part in today, and then uh, the um, third part of the webinar series. Okay, so here are some of the current uh, existing geostationary uh, sensors which has similar capabilities, uh, just like ABI instrument, adv advanced baseline imager. So three of them, uh, goes R, goes S, and goes T, all located over America. So they look over Northern America, South America, the Pacific Oceans, and Atlantic Ocean, all the way to the coast of Africa. And they provide every 10 minute measurement. So this is really an excellent measurement which has been become available in last three, four years uh, over this part of the world. There are two Himawaris, Himawari 8 and 9, which has sensor called AHI, Advanced, Base, Advanced Himawari Major. And that AHI actually makes measurement over Asia, covering Australia to the, all the way to the, uh, uh, to the Japan and uh, northern part of uh, Russia. And these measurements um, are very identical in many sense to the GOES R series. So you have almost similar observation every 10 minute again. The Himawari 8 is currently operational. Uh, Himawari 9 
which is already in the orbit will become operational in a uh, in couple of months uh, starting in December. So you will see the data from the, the satellite. More recently, uh, Korean Space Agency launched this AMI, which is uh, also providing uh, observation over Asia, but you will see that its observ uh, field of view has shifted a little bit more toward west. So you can see more coverage over India, which is not that much available in the Himavari data. Uh, China also has a similar capability, uh, but the data uh, probably is not available in public domain. Uh, once European Space Agency launched this called Sentinel-4, Sentinel, uh, uh, sorry, the Meteosat third generation satellite, which will have the FCI instrument, uh, which is very similar to ABI, will have a global uh, coverage uh, of every 10 minute uh, showing similar measurements. So, and then India also planned to launch sometime uh, in said series of satellite, which will have similar capabilities. Okay, so a little bit more on these coverage, special coverage of these uh, sensors. So what you see here on the left side is AHI full disk coverage. Like I said, it has three different mode of measurement. One is called full disk, which is taken every 10 minutes. Uh, there are uh, mesoscale measurements and there are regional measurements. So the mesoscale measurements are usually taken when there are specific atmospheric events or events going on. If there are volcanic eruption happening on Earth, you can actually take every 30 second measurements using Himawari or ABI. Um, the two and a half minute uh, scan is regional. They are typically located of the country of the origin. So in this case, South Korea and Japan, they are making measurements uh, in that part of the uh, region. So they make every two and a half minute for their own application. Similarly, the ghost series of satellite, uh, as you can see the coverage, the goes west cover most of the America, with the Pacific Ocean goes east cover most of the America and the Atlantic Oceans. Um, so they have, there is some overlap between the coverage uh, and I will talk about a little bit about uh, the pixels and the angles uh, due to which uh, we need multiple satellites. Again, similar type of uh, scan mode, you have mesoscale mode, you have conus every five minutes in this case, so it will take entire US and then the full disk every 10 minutes. So in many, many ways, uh, these are very, very similar observation. Now let's look at the capabilities or the spectral capabilities of these instruments. Uh, people have used the GOES generation of satellite, the GOES 13 or older, you will see they have only limited number of channels, four, five, three to five channels. And those channels are typically very broadband channels, uh, which covers larger part of the spectrum. This particular, uh, satellite, the GOES ABI series, uh, has 16 channels. In those 16 channels, you can see an example of how the certain part of the Earth look in each of those channels. So the first six channels are the visual part and then the remaining channels are the infrared channels. Um, these 16 channels makes continuous measurements every 10 minute or five minute or 30 seconds, depending on the scanning mode and provides you different uh, piece of information about the earth atmosphere system so let's look those what are those specific channels and their special resolutions or footprint on the earth surface or the pixel size in other words on the left you have ahi which is giving you spectral measurements every 10 minutes and you will see these 16 channels starting from the blue 0.46 nano uh, uh, 0.46 micrometers or 460 nanometer to all the way to 13.3 micrometers so you have all the channels here now you will notice that in advanced himawari imager there is a channel uh, in the green part of the solar spectrum so we have a blue channel we have a green channel and we have a red channel the special resolution of the, these channels varies. Most of the channels are at two kilometer nominal resolution, which is a coarser resolution compared to MODIS, which is one kilometer, or VIRS, which is 375 meter resolution. So a little bit coarser compared to the uh, some of the polar orbiting popular sensors. But these RGB channels have actually 
one kilometer resolution red and uh, sorry the blue and green and then the red has a half kilometer resolution and then 0.86 which is often used for ocean application has about half kilometer resolution so the resolution varies abi which is on goes east and goes west has a similar spatial resolution and similar uh, channels there are some differences in channels you will notice that goes east or west or the abi does not have a green channel okay so remember this is very very critical it has a blue and red but they they do not have red channel um, green channel but instead they have a 1.38 channel which is used to detect uh, thin cirrus cloud in the atmosphere which is very very critical for air quality application as we talk in the algorithm parts in part two so the the reason why they do not have green channel is because green channel is highly correlated with the blue and red channels and often it can be derived and that is what they are doing to create the stroopler images which we will talk later on okay so just to give you a quick um, view here is similar to polar orbiting satellite geostation satellites have the similar level of data products uh, we have level 1 or level 1b which is typically radiance data spectral radiance measurements all those 16 bands in their native resolution the geophysical pro products are called level 2 products they are derived using these spectral radiance using a uh, physical retrieval algorithm so this is gone through an algorithm and SMC. sometimes these products are at native resolution sometimes they are at uh, reduced spatial resolution or coarser resolution and then uh, the level three product which are typically gridded data they are averaged over time over a day or a month or over one hour period uh, so depending on the temporal average and different level three product can be created and then they can also be averaged over space so typically spectral radiance are half kilometer one kilometer two kilometers they are also about the same resolution some of them are uh, downgraded to coarser resolution and then when it goes to the gridded level three product they are typically quarter degree or 0.1 degree or one degree uh, depending on the specific products uh, the level three spatial resolution can vary and we use all these product for air quality application uh, today i'm going to more focus on the spectral radiance which how we can use that for air quality application but in week uh, part two and part three you will learn a lot more about level two and some level three as well okay so let's switch gear here a little bit um, let me actually put a poll question uh, so that you can get a feeling about how we are doing and then uh, I will move on to the next topic which is true color imagery so you will again see a poll question and you will get about 30 seconds to respond to it uh, please respond uh, so the first question is geostationary satellite provide global coverage true or false and I am closing the poll now we have about 60 percent people responded that's good so the correct answer is false geostation satellites provide regional coverage if you if you combine multiple geostation satellites then they can provide your global coverage but one single geostation satellite only provides regional coverage so maybe the question was not very clear but i mean to have only one geostationary so polar orbiting satellites Come, uh, uh, provides you global coverage okay so let's move on to the next question and this is something i did not cover but a math question more likely and we talked about how many uh, full disk image are taken by abi goes east on uh, goes 16 or goes is in uh, how frequently they take full disk image so if you remember that uh, frequency then you can calculate how many images will be done in one hour so i understand this is not a direct but uh, 
a derived question from the information which I have provided in other slide. So maybe we can wait another 10 more seconds. Okay, I'm going to close poll now. We have about 50% and the response is in the order. We have 50 plus percent people saying six, which is correct answer. So remember both ABI and AHI makes full disk measurements every 10 minutes. So in 60 minutes, one hour, we will have six full disk images uh, from one of these sensor so six is the correct answer so 10 minute is the frequency for the full disk measurements okay and this is something i just talked about so let's take another 30 second hi has a green band but abi does not is that true or false and closing and showing the results so the answer is true HI has a green band, but AVI does not. And we just talked about it uh, a few minutes ago. So that let me get back to the presentation and we'll talk about the true color imageries now. Okay, so as I was saying, the true color imageries uh, or RGVs or level 1B data, uh, adds it stand for RGB, means red, green, blue so true color imageries are made using these three colors when you combine the measurements with three different spectral band in blue green and red then we get a true color imageries or rgb image and why it is called true color images we'll see when we start looking some of those images so what you do this term is uh, primarily actually derived from a uh, display uh, computer displays uh, and uh, it basically simulate uh, how human eye will see certain features uh, if you look so for example uh, if when we combine these three channels the clouds will appear white uh, water will appear darker vegetation will appear more greener and so on and so forth so here is an example of true color image uh, this is taken from uh, a polar orbiting VR sensors, uh, which has similar three channels, uh, red, green, and blue. And what you see here in the image is a view in the red channel, view in the green channel, and the blue, and the last one is the view in the blue channel. So when you plot the data or the map the data in individual channels, the radians, you will see this kind of view. Now, in First look, they look very similar to each other. But if you look carefully, you will see the blue is much more brighter over clouded area. The red has a lot more contrast. You'll see darker color over ocean. Clouds are looking much more brighter. There's less contrast in blue channels and the green is in between the two. When you combine these th three channels, it is become true color image or RGB. And now you will see the colors start appearing differently and they look almost similar to what you will look from your human eyes. Uh, if you are uh, traveling in an aircraft, uh, you will look down the earth, you will see similar features as you see in the true color image. So that is why it is called true color image. Now, in case of AHI, since it has a green channel, they use these three channels to make an RGB or true color images. In case of ABI, ABI does not have a green channel, so they actually derive a green channel using blue and red, and then it is used to uh, create the RGB. Okay, so here is a... Uh, here is a RGB image, uh, which is uh, just to give you an example, right? So you see clouds, you see a, some pollution or smoke in this particular case, and then you can see uh, some darker water. So what, what creates these different features or different colors in a true color image? So it depends on going back to the satellite remote sensing part where I was explaining that depending on the wavelength, of incoming solar radiation, 
and depending on the properties of these specific features for example cloud pollution or water there will be interaction there will be scattering absorption attenuation of the light and based combination of these two will actually come will have a uh, impact on that outgoing radiation whether it will be so for example the clouds clouds reflects most of the visible light in all of the solar spectrum band uh, equally almost equally so that is why the clouds looks white whereas the the water actually can absorb a lot of these uh, red green and blue bands sufficiently so it will have a less intensity in the uh, reflected back to the space so that is why the cloud the water is actually appearing darker similarly the vegetation the soil uh, based on how much energy they are reflecting and how much they are actually uh, absorbing in those three channels their color will vary similarly that is why you will see this some of the pollution is actually appearing little it's not as bright as cloud but it is uh, little bit grayish in color and that depends on the size shape and their chemical composition of the particle so it is based on uh, physics how radiation interact with each of these features uh, here is an example i'll just quickly move over this uh, again uh, there are different features in this image and i want you to just note down here uh, let me this particular feature here okay uh, this one is called glint uh, then you have some number two which is smoke and has so over uh, northern india during the post monsoon season there are a lot of biomass burning happens and that actually produce the smoke so that smoke mixed with the local pollution is creating this haziness this white area over the smoke is actually very smooth surface and these are very low level cloud or fog uh, then you have some clouds all over the places here here uh, you have over mountain if you look carefully the snow has a specific structure and little bit brighter uh, than the clouds and these are also clouds so in an image you can actually identify these land ocean and atmospheric features uh, based on how they will appear to our human eye another example uh, of uh, true color image showing uh, fog over indo gandetic valley in uh, india and over nepal and uh, uh, bangladesh area and there is a lot of haze which is actually transporting uh, and then there are some clouds uh, which you can see okay the glint so here if you look at this glint uh, in this particular image which is coming from the polar orbiting satellite viewers you will see the glint has a vertically over uh, ocean and the glint is produced by the uh, specific angles uh, when sunlight and satellites are on a specific angle it's called a specular reflection though so that is the bright area over ocean typically it is mostly over ocean and you will see it is along the orbit vertically when you will see that in geostationary it is typically in circular shape so these are uh, glint area in a geostationary orbit again from ahi this bright area or ocean and it moves with the time because the sun moves from morning to evening as solar zenith angle or sun's position change in the sky this glint will move from east to west or west to east depending on uh, where we are looking and then here you can see uh, over Pacific Ocean, this is image from the goes west, and then you can see uh, from the goes east, uh, half of the glint is over ocean, and then over land there is no glint. So the glint is very important because we cannot actually uh, retrieve uh, particle information if there is a glint. Little bit more on some of the specific uh, particles, how they appears in a true color image. Again, these examples are from uh, polar orbiting satellite MODIS and VIRS, but uh, I'll show some example from geostationary as well. Uh, Australian dust, you will see this dust looking brown, uh, but it is uh, over a very bright surface, so there is a it's a difficult to see the contrast between underlying land. Uh, land area and the dust in the atmosphere haze and smoke like i said earlier very contracting contrasting so you can see clear features um, 
again this is over east coast of us uh, during summer month the pollution get transported over atlantic ocean which you can see in this form and then this particular example is a uh, volcanic eruption in indonesia which is actually putting out a lot of um, so2 and other uh, ash uh, in the atmospheres and you can see a thick plume and because it is a sulfate type of aerosols or so2 um, it has very similar properties uh, very highly scattering type of aerosols and it almost looks like a thick cloud some other examples again dust over saharan deserts you can see as soon as dust reaches over ocean it start looking very nicely because because of the darker background these are the smoke plumes coming out from the wildfires in california uh, similarly these are some of the haze which is actually transporting from the alaskan fires these are the smoke coming out from the oil fires and these are very specific so you can see uh, very dark in color so oil fires smoke which comes from the oils are very absorbing in nature they are almost like black carbons absorbs most of the energy so that is why they are looking very darker in this particular and all these measurements are possible from both polar orbiting and geostationary observations so now let's look some quickly some movies and i will show a uh, little bit later how to actually generate some of these movies uh, using some of the tools which are available on there so this particular example is uh, a smoke transport over northwest and this is uh, you can see how the smoke from these fires are actually transporting all over across us and these are every 5 minute measurements uh, over us and some of the smoke pollution uh, smoke uh, particles are actually facilitating pyroclimus cloud which are generating in this region so you can see uh, really real time when you have measurement frequency very high as high as 5 minute or 10 minute you can see the movement of these uh, smoke once you actually use this uh, uh, data into a model uh, then you can forecast very accurately where and how much smoke will be observed in given location another example here actually you will see a dust uh, uh, again this is from the go satellite uh, you will see a dust storm which is shown in this so you will see uh, in this area particularly where the arrows are showing you will see a dust is originating and then it is this one particularly is a uh, dust storm which is originating in this part uh, nevada and uh, new mexico area okay another example of the fires this is from uh, goes 16 or goes east you can see uh, in different part of texas and oklahoma you will see the uh, or the kansas i believe uh, small fires are actually starting and how the smoke plume is uh, transporting towards the north with the weather system and you can see the generation of pyroclimus cloud Uh, along the way so this is not possible from the polar orbiting satellite because you don't have that frequency measurement and this is the advantage of geostationary or frequency measurements again uh, very recently uh, this is a i think mac uh, i think this is yeah magnifiers which happens in july uh, you can see how huge the smoke plume from this fire is coming and how quickly Uh, the pyroclimus clouds are forming so the magnitude of this uh, fire was huge another fire from the june this year earlier you can see uh, it's a small fire but it is originating and going away in some time this is every 5 minute imageries you can see one here there is some dust here which is originating at the same time Uh, so you you will see here is some dust on this side also so the smoke and dust both are actually originating from two different places and can be monitored with this frequent measurements okay uh, this is very popular example and you might have seen right this is a dust storm uh, which is again from this year earlier june month every year during the spring and summer uh, dust from the saharan deserts over north of africa originates 
and actually it get transported all over Atlantic and all the way to the Americas. It goes reaches to the Amazonia uh, forest in uh, South America. It reaches to the Central America and it is also reaches to the east coast of uh, United States. And this can create actually significant issues with local air quality, specifically uh, more on PM10 side. So uh, again, this is a goes east image, so we can see how this uh, actually does originating and transporting our Atlantic Ocean. Uh, another example of dust transport from Australia. Uh, this is taken by uh, Himawari and this is image from August 2020. Uh, Southern Hemisphere summertime, uh, Australia has a huge deserts and uh, often they get actually dust storms. So this is a dust storm in southern part of Australia. So the uh, southeast part uh, transporting over um, our Pacific Ocean there. Okay, and this is the last example from the geostationary, which is a uh, volcanic eruption, which happened very recently, uh, earlier in the year in January. And you can see this is a uh, GOES 17 or the GOES West, uh, uh, zoom version of uh, South Southern Pacific Ocean, uh, where you can see the eruption of volcano, uh, and this is, I think, every 10-minute observation. So you can really see some of the fast changing uh, features of phenomena which are happening in atmosphere or Earth surface using this geostationary. Uh, very, very well. Okay, so I think uh, with that, um, let me put out a couple of more polls here and then I, I want to finish up this presentation with a couple of more slides. Uh, or let me actually do those slide first and then I'll do the poll question and then we'll go to the exercise. Okay, so since we have talked only about the true color imageries or level 1B data, but in week two and week three, we will do actually use level two products. So I want to introduce the scientific terms which we are going to be using a lot more, uh, which may we may not have time to actually explain in week two and week three. So one of the quantity in level two product often used for air quality application is called aerosol optical depth. And the aerosol optical depth is uh, expressed, it's an optical uh, uh, quantity and it is express the quantity of light removed by a beam by scattering or absorption during its path through medium. So think about uh, this is a ground instruments called CIMEL or sun photometer typically makes measurement of aerosol optical depth from the ground. It looks directly to the sun. So sun's radiation is coming this one I zero and then it interact with the incoming solar radiation, uh, sorry, it, the, the solar radiation interact with the particles or the aerosols in the atmosphere. And these measurements are only taken during cloud free condition. If this cloud moves over here, then we cannot take this kind of measurement. So aerosol optical depth measurements are always under cloud free condition. When it interact with the sun, uh, this particles over here in the atmosphere, it will either absorb or scatter. Uh, some of the scattered light will actually transmit toward the earth where the sun photometer is sitting and making similar measurement in different spectral channel as we saw from the satellite. And then once we know how much radiation is, was coming and how much we measured, we can use this kind of mathematical equation to calculate the optical depth of the atmosphere. Now what you calculate optical depth is not just because of the particle, but there are gases, water vapors, and other components in the atmosphere, which needs to be corrected. For example, you can calculate the, how much optical depth is due to the gas, how much is due to the air particles, which is called typically Rayleigh scattering. These two can be theoretically calculated very accurately. Once we know this, we can calculate the aerosol optical depth by subtracting these two quantities, which is uh, M is a solar zenith angle. So uh, depending on uh, angle of the sun with respect to the sun photometer um, uh, that uh, optical depth can be 
calculated. And typically this optical depth is defined for particular wavelength on which it is making measurement. Most common wavelength used for this measurements and for reporting purpose is 550, the green uh, band, uh, which has, uh, which is often used for air quality application as well. Okay, so this is about aerosol optical depth. Now, what is its relationship with the PM 2.5? So just give you an example here, if you have a very hazy condition, right? So this is a picture taken in Pittsburgh's uh, around the same time of the day on two different days. On the day on July 18 on the right side image, it was taken when the air quality was good. The ground measured PM 2.5 was about four microgram per cubic meter. You can see clean, uh, clear view of the high rises building and uh, topography in these pictures. On the left side, this was taken at the same time from the same location, uh, but another day when the air quality was not that great. Uh, the PM 2.5 on that particular day measured from the ground was 45 microgram per cubic meter. And if you make measurement of aerosol optical depth on these two days, then it will be higher. This number 0.8 is just approximation, uh, a first guess, uh, 0.8 in this case, uh, on the high PM 2.5 loading case and 0.1 on the low PM 2.5 loading case. So air quality or the PM 2.5 concentration is intrinsically related to aerosol optical depth, although they represent two different quantities. AOD represent total column, entire column from the surface to the top of the atmospheres, as we saw in earlier image from here to here whereas the PM 2.5 is measured near the surface. Uh, one is mass concentration, one is optical properties. Um, this is defined for a specific range of particle size. This is defined for all the particle size. Then. So there are significant difference in these two quantities, but it's still AOD is very good proxy uh, for PM 2.5. And there have been many, many data sets uh, generated uh, of PM 2.5, which are based on aerosol optical depth measurement from the satellites. And then finally, once you have air quality, PM 2.5 uh, or air quality, you can use this uh, to generate air quality index, which can often be uh, transmitted or communicated to the public for safety purposes with health advisories as done by environmental agencies, for example, in US, US EPA. Okay, so I think that's about all I have. I have some references here, uh, which you can go over. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about any of these trucular images or anything else, uh, if you want to get more details on the ABI sensors or the GO satellites, uh, there is a nice BAMS article which uh, will give a lot of details about the sensors and the missions itself. Okay, so now I'm going to switch and do a couple of poll questions and then we'll quickly do a uh, a exercise where I will show you how to access some of this uh, trucular imagery. So let me get to the poll. Um, okay, so here is first poll, and this is not testing anything here, but I just want to get a feeling about from the audience. Uh, which part of the world do you like to study from a geostationary satellite? And you can choose. Uh, your area of interest uh, in which you would uh, like to have a geostationary satellite data available for your research or air quality applications. Okay, so we are getting about 20% vote. Let me keep it open for another five more seconds. Um, Okay, let me close the polls and just for every, so we have pretty good uh, dis distribution. Uh, of course, the current existing uh, sat geostationary satellite provides measurement only over Americas and Asia's. So that is uh, one of probably the reason you see uh, about 35, 35% distribution there and then Africa and Europe we don't have a, a geostationary sat satellite with similar capabilities as GOES series of satellite. And of course, uh, there, there will be, once we have the Meteosat third generation over Africa, Europe, uh, we will have a global coverage. So thank you for that. And I 
think I have a last question. And this is related to uh, the concept which I just discussed, aerosol optical depth. Uh, I'm just wondering if you ever used aerosol optical depth data from any source. Uh, doesn't matter whether it's satellites or ground-based uh, measurements or model output. If you ever used, uh, please just say yes so that we, uh, this question I want to get so that we, emphasis we want to put on the fundamental definition of this particular quantity uh, in part two and part three. Okay, so we have about 50-50% distribution. Um, okay, so I think this is good to know so that we can actually remind our participants about this specific quantity and what it means. Okay, so let me hide this and uh, what I'm going to do next is uh, I will sh spend 10-15 uh, minutes in showing some of the online tools uh, where you can access some of these uh, trupular imagery. So for that I will go on internet. Uh, let me show you a couple of slides actually which has a link to these uh, these tools so that you can access them so first one is the satellite library by the NOAA, where you can find both goes east and west and goes 18 imageries this is an excellent tool uh, NOAA has very recently launched this uh, there is a called slider uh, it's a again managed by NOAA from the colorado state university and what it does is it provides you near real time data from goes east west and himavari and this is only rgbs and there are some additional images which you can get from there the only uh, limitation of this tool is it only keeps the data for last two three months only so if you're looking for historical data you won't, won't be able to get from this but this really provides you animation uh, capabilities uh, where you can actually animate and save the image uh, for your own uh, purpose later on. Uh, JAXA, the Japanese um, Space Agency has a their own tool called P3. Uh, it provides actually way to access and visualize uh, AHI, the Advanced Himawari Imager data. Uh, as you can see in this screenshot, it has fire data, aerosol optical depth, and then the RGB images. So it only provides data from Himawari. Uh, it is a nice tool. Um, the data products which are uh, shown in this tool are all generated by JAXA. Uh, so some of these Himawari products are also generated in US, which is not part of this particular tool. So you can explore this tool in your own time. The tool which I'm going to actually um, give you two today is uh, NASA Worldview, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, this specific tool has, uh, uh, in last couple of years ago, they have started adding geostationary data as well. So it has uh, both goes east and west and Himawari data, and I will walk you through some examples. So we will look actually these uh, two cases. Uh, we we'll look January 15, uh, the case uh, when there was a volcanic eruption, which we saw the image earlier uh, in Southwest Pacific Ocean. And then I'll also look the March 15 case uh, where the, there was huge dust storms over, uh, over Asia. And then you can also look uh, more recently uh, from the last month, the fires in uh, Sacramento, California. So with that, let me share my uh, internet. And if you want, Please, uh, you can follow along with me uh, to this exercise. So, if you do not know where the NASA Worldview, uh, I typically just Google it, just say NASA Worldview, and the first link will show you the NASA Worldview too. Okay, and it will load. When it will load first time, you will see a uh, pop-up window appears and this pop-up window actually uh, shows some of the specific uh, categories or features for which the data are available so you will notice here that it is not only serving air quality community this particular website is designed to serve many many different communities all around uh, the world so you can see the cloud 
uh, Landsat Sentinel data. You can see the hurricane monitoring, dust fires, uh, night lights, um, almost all the satellite data which are available in real time uh, are available from this website. So you can actually uh, explore this in your own time, but let me walk you through the exercise. Okay. So when you open, you will see this is a default view of the world view. The image which you will see is uh, acquired by MODIS sensors from Equa, which is uh, in afternoon orbit. Uh, and these are the orbital gaps from the polar orbiting satellite. On the bottom, you can see the date and time window uh, to change. You can go back in time. Uh, you can change the year, month, or day. Okay. Uh, this camera button is to make animation. I'll show you later on. Uh, on the right side, these are different features. So the camera button will take a snapshot over the area. You can select any area and take a snapshot. Uh, this particular share this map features is actually very nice. It creates a permanent link of the view which you are seeing. If you have actually overlaid layers here and you create on the short link and copy paste and share with social media, it will remain active forever as, as long as the data are available in this uh, uh, tool. And then the search will actually, you can search anything. Okay. Uh, so you can search specific features, you can search place names. Uh, so for example, California. Okay. So once you search there, it will take you to that place, um, and then we'll show. Uh, now that image is not available yet, so you can look yesterday's image for that place. So. Uh, that's how the search features works. Okay. Now on the right size is um, are actually three different tapes, layers, events, and data. Events will actually show you some of the latest events, uh, whether they are rain, fires, snow, and you can choose, uh, and then that will take you to that. For example, if I click on this tropical cyclone Vanit, Valita, it will take me to the that geographical location and then it will give me some examples which i can display here so there are different things which are displacing rainfall winds and things like that so this is a good features again if you want to explore this in real time so the one which i want to show you is okay let me get out of this uh, and then remove this things okay so you have place value, place uh, place levels, so you can see in uh, uh, where you are on the Earth. Okay, let me reduce the size so that I can see zoom in and zoom out. Okay, and then you can see coastline, so that will show you the boundaries, geopolitical boundaries. Okay, there are multiple types of that. These are just to help to navigate to, through the map. Now in the base layer, there are three, uh, four different options. Modis Terra, Modis Equa, Veers on Sumi NPP and Veers on Moa 20. Now what we want to look at is, uh, we want to look uh, geostationary satellites, right? So I'm going to add layer, okay? And again, you will see a list of many different features, many different data sets. You can actually browse through this list. But let's search geo right because that's what the geostationary stand for geo right and as soon as you search geo there are different layers which start appearing here the first one is called geo color true color image uh, goes east abi okay i can click that the geo color goes west abi and these sorry this is the night time so we want the daytime right so let me Okay, I think these are the daytime and the night times are basically multispectral IR images during the night. And then you have this individual spectral band like we saw red channels, right? So these are the Himawari goes west, goes east. Uh, these are the infrared channel. 
Now from Himavari, uh, I believe we have a air mass channel. Okay, I don't see where is the Himavari. Yeah, here is the Himavari HI uh, red channel and there should be clean in product. There is air on those rest. Yeah, air mass Himavari is similar to RGB. It's not exactly RGB. Uh, it's uh, derived using different combination of channel, but you can see some of the features. Okay. So I'm going to select these three images. Once I select and then click on the cross on top right corner, those layers will start appearing here. Okay, so let me close this Himavari for a minute. I'm, I'm interested in the goes west image. So I'm going to also close goes east image. Now, we are trying to look this volcanic eruption, uh, which was happened on January 15 uh, in Southern Pacific patient Ocean, right? And we want to look the goes west image. So I will go and change the date uh, from October to January and 15th of January. That's when we want to get. And this is the Southern Pacific Ocean. That's where we, uh, the volcano happened. Now, as soon as you load the geostationary, you will see in the, there is additional time table started here. Okay, now this is a 10 minute, or you can custom how fast you want to move by using arrows. So I'm going to just use the 10 minute data. Now, zero GMT is daytime in the uh, Southern Pacific Ocean, right? So this is 20, and I know the volcano happens around 3 GMT. So I'm going to just start from the 3 uh, so that we can quickly look the volcanic eruption. Okay, so this is 3 GMT. Um, this is 310. And let, let's first locate the volcano so that we can actually look at more closely. So you will see here is your volcano, which we saw earlier. So let me go back again in time. So there is almost no action here. This is 350Z, okay? I move 10 minute, again 4Z. So four, four o'clock, there is not much visible sign of the eruption. 410, you can see this huge cloud coming out from that volcano. This is 420, 430, 440, 450, five. So this is within one hour. And then you can keep going. And you will notice that the sun has started setting in this part of the world as you move. So the darker side on the east side started appearing the volcano actually started looking really huge now we lost most of the visible light so what you see is the nighttime reflection you can still see this volcano right now if you want to make a movie of this what you do is you click here on this setup animation or the camera button uh, you can select january 15 i'll start at 4 z to January 15 at 6.30 Z. Frame rate I can choose and then click and then set up my area for which I want to create and then click create GIF. It will take some time uh, depending on how many uh, frames you have taken. Uh, probably I have taken too many frames. So let me actually close this and select less number of frames so that it can be done quickly. Uh, and then do it again. Hopefully this will be faster. I've just taken almost six frame only. Uh, that will create you a animated GIF image for that particular volcano. Okay, so it started creating animation. So you can see this is the same animation which I have shown you earlier in the PowerPoint. Uh, and this is using Ghost, uh, Ghost West satellite. You can see the same in Ghost 
in Himawari data also. And you can download and it will download the image as a GIF image on your. So this is really nice uh, feature of wild blue. Now, let me take you to the show you the fire example uh, from September 16 to 15 using the Goes East data in Sacramento, California. Okay. So I'm going to load Goes East and then go to September and remove the Himawari and select the Goes. So if you click this I one time, the cross line is basically the layer will disappear. And then you can also move these images up and down so that if you want to see the place name, you can just drag them and they will move actually nicely. Uh, uh, the order of the display will change. Okay, so here is California. And here is Sacramento, that's where the fire is, right? And we are on September 15, 6, 6 to 15. So let's go to September 6. And I'm going to actually do change by day. Um, I'm going to go into daytime, which is about 16 GT or more, right? That is when daytime in here and then move find the fire first. So you can see there are some smoke on 7th, 8th, you can see a lot more smoke. 9th, there's a lot more. 10th, smoke is actually transporting and in different parts of the 11. This is 12. This again cloud has been cleared. And you can see the smoke plume is transporting towards the north. These are all smoke plumes. This one. You can see this. And let's look at this in more frequent time stamps. So this is September 16, 1650Z, and I am actually incrementing by 10 minutes. So you can see how slowly actually smoke is moving probably the wind speed is very slow and you can animate it actually so if you don't want to create gif you can animate the entire screen just say play and it will actually animate the entire screen first time it will take some time to load the image once the images are loaded um, then it will be pretty fast okay this is september 15. Uh oh the animation went back to the earlier setting. September and then this is 16. So you can see. This. Okay, so I think uh, this is one way to access the true color imageries from the uh, goes east, goes west, and Himawari. Uh, and there are other ways which I shown in the PowerPoint slide, which you can use. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the level two data sets are not yet, uh, from GST satellites are not yet in world view. Uh, hopefully they will become available in coming time. Uh, but right now you can access the RGB images. So with that, uh, let me close this session and uh, I will ask uh, Dr. Aaron um, to actually give us a 10 minute presentation on uh, Tempo mission, which is a new air quality mission coming up over the Americas. Thank you everyone. And we, I will be here for question answers after Dr. Aaron presents. So Aaron, you are up. All right, well, thanks Pawan. And the RSET team in general for inviting me here. Today. So like Pawan said, I'm gonna be presenting on the Tempo mission, some background information um, on the mission. I'm Aaron Nager, the Tempo Deputy Program Applications Lead. I'm here at the University of Alabama at Huntsville and NASA Marshall. So, I wanted to first start off with a few quick facts on the Tempo mission. It was, or it is NASA's first Earth Venture instrument that was selected in 2012. Tempo will observe atmospheric pollution every daylight hour at high spatial resolution from geostationary Earth orbit. and 
I'll look at the coverage of tempo in this full field of regard coverage of tempo over greater North America here that tempo will provide. Tempo is a ultraviolet and visible ink spectrometer, and that will operate in the ultraviolet and visible wavelength regions here, shown at the bottom right from about 290 to 490 nanometers and 540 to 740 nanometers. And this capability will enable Tempo to be sensitive to policy relevant pollutants such as nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, ozone, and aerosols as well. And this will this capability will also enable Tempo to separate and distinguish between boundary layer and free tropospheric and stratospheric ozone, which would be kind of the first ever, first ever retrieval of PBL ozone from space. And we had a really um, exciting event recently. We had our the Tempo instrument was integrated with our host satellite, Intellisat 40E. Recently, we have a launch date in the early March 2023 timeframe with a target of March 1st to a position of 91 degrees west longitude. And we are also a member of a geostationary satellite constellation for observing pollution over the Northern Hemisphere. And that includes the GEMS mission, which we talked on later on in this training. Our session. So Powen already gave a background on how I measure and measure the atmosphere. So I'll make this quick and just say that Tempo will measure the intensity of backscattered ultraviolet and visible radiation. This is ultimately influenced by the surface and atmosphere conditions. We then employ retrieval algorithms to derive the slant column densities from these measured top of atmosphere radiances in known trace gas absorption spectral windows. And the tra this trace gas column density is essentially the total number of molecules of a given gas, such as NO2, along this light path from the surface to the satellite location. And we then use that information and convert the slant column density to a vertical column density directly above the tempo footprint location to provide information on that trace in the vertical. So quickly here, this is kind of our proposed our uh, data products that tempo we anticipate from tempo after launch. This starts with our level 1B radiance data that I just mentioned, and which is used to derive these level two products uh, shown here on this table. This includes cloud products and also our pollution products such as ozone profile, which includes a zero to two kilometer or PBL ozone column information. We have nitrogen dioxide, formaldehyde, sulfur dioxide, and aerosol. And these are also near real, proposed near real time products for NO2, formaldehyde, SO2, and aerosol with a data latency of about two to three hours. And we have other products as well, such as Glaxol, water vapor, bromine, and a Tempo goes our synergistic product, which will include aerosol information, such as UV aerosol optical depth and visible aerosol optical depth, in addition to fire hotspot information and lightning information, et cetera. We also have a level three product on our list as well, which is essentially a gridded version of these level two products shown here. Uh, our proposed resolution of that product is two by two kilometers squared currently. And looking down this list right here, most of our products are gonna be at the temp tempo nominal footprint resolution of two by 4.75 kilometers squared, except for ozone profile. This will require additional averaging over several tempo footprints to increase the signal to noise ratio and ultimately increase the accuracy of that product to the community. And you can see this really revolutionary aspect part of tempo here, where we have this hourly information on these trace gases as well. But we also have level four products uh, that are going to be uh, proposed for the mission after launch too. All right, so looking at the operational timeline here, this is based on a March 2023 launch date. Keep that in mind. This will be shifted if that launch date does encounter um, delays. So our current tempo commissioning phase is set for June through September 2023. We plan to release level 1B data about four months after com the commissioning phase and level 2 and level 3 data about six months after the commissioning phase. So we have a target of March 2024 for those level 2 and level 3 products. 
the data will be publicly available via NASA Earth Data Search in that CDF HDF5 format. That's our baseline format for the mission. We are also looking at other data formats and data services for the Temple mission as well during this pre-launch phase of the mission. The latency of our standard offline products is really pretty good of three to six hours, except for the ozone profile, which will have a day latency due to just the essentially the computational expense of running that algorithm. Our proposed near real-time products will have a latency of about two to three hours, as I mentioned in that previous slide. Our baseline mission length is 20 months with a possible 10 plus year lifetime, depending on uh, senior review note extensions every couple of years. Colin mentioned NASA Worldview earlier. So we do, we will have tempo imagery and products available in Worldview. And there's an EPA RSIG gateway, which will also be used to serve up tempo data to the community as well. All right, so I wanted to share here uh, kind of the, the granular information of how tempo will be served up to the community in terms of level three, level two data files after launch. So this is showing the different granule information starting across the east portion of the Fiddle Regard to the west portion of the Fiddle Regard. So this is 10 different granules, which will be served up to the community uh, for each of these complete hour scans. This will often ultimately enable more efficient distribution of tempo data, especially near real time tempo data, and also reduce the data load for those users who may only want a certain, or focus only on a certain area of the field of regard, they will, you know, only have to download one or two granule files, perhaps, rather than the, rather than the entire field of regard. All right, so I want to show an animation here, an approximation of how Tempo will scan after launch. This you'll see here, Tempo is starting out across the east and then eventually covering the entire field of regard from the east to west. And then later on in the afternoon, so we're seeing the morning scans here across the east coast and now as we get more daylight across the west you're seeing that scan line moving to the west and eventually you will see that scan line moving across the east moving to the west as we lose daylight across the east later on in the afternoon so ultimately tempo will perform these standard east to west hourly daytime scans across this field of regard over greater north america what is not shown here are also sub-hourly scans that will be performed for the Tempo mission, which includes optimized scans across the east and west when the solar zenith angle is too high over portions of the field of regard to complete our nominal hourly scan. And we also have these special operations designed for the mission for dedicated experiments, such as air quality disasters or wildfire smoke events, for example, where we can actually look at selected portions of this field of regard at higher temporal resolution. So yeah, you saw that whole entire animation here and, uh, and kind of concluding there across the West as we lose daylight in the East. All right, so I want to zoom in closer here to California. This is showing our troposphere, our pre-launch tropospheric NO2 product for Tempo that we've created for the, for the user community. And we've zoomed in here to California again, showing this uh, information on NO2 from the morning to the evening here and ultimately this is showing the ability of tempo to observe these rapidly varying no2 columns within uh, you know your your urban areas and traffic corridors across california the central valley for example you can see the very you know, rapidly evolving no2 columns in that region and we have a wildfire smoke event that occurred on this day later on in the afternoon which is also highlighted in this proxy product very high no2 columns associated with that smoke event. Um, as you can see here, our current observing capabilities, such as the NASA ozone monitoring instrument, which provides this midday, this limited midday information, uh, overpass information on air pollutants, is really incapable of showing this full diurnal picture. You only get a couple of, uh, you know, a couple, couple of snapshots each day through our current observing capabilities. Tempo will dramatically increase our capabilities for observing pollution in general. All right, so I wanted to also highlight our ozone profile product that will be available for Tempo after launch. This is showing our pre-launch product, but nevertheless, we have this zero to two kilometer ozone animation here. This is for one day and our tropospheric ozone product. 
And ultimately this proxy product is showing the ability for Tempo to track ozone pollution in the tropospheric layer throughout the daytime. This can be a really revolutionary aspect of the Tempo mission. Um, you know, this proxy profile product here also demonstrates the sensitivity of the Tempo instrument to ozone pollution in the lower troposphere. We'll be able to capture that with Tempo, ultimately providing new information on ozone pollution within this layer of air where people live and breathe, which will be critical moving forward. All right, so I kind of wanted to finish off here with this final slide looking at, well, first looking at the Tempo application areas. Uh, you know, Tempo data will ultimately enable new and enhanced health and air quality applications for the community. Here's kind of our chart here of the full breadth of Tempo applications. This includes those health and air quality thematic areas that you see here, including regulatory science, public health, air pollution emissions, and monitoring. But also we have weather analysis and forecasting applications with Tempo and vegetation ocean monitoring applications with Tempo. And we have a very active early adopter community with Tempo as well. And here's some of those Tempo early adopter studies that have, are currently being looked at by, the, by those community members, uh, looking at NO2 pollution inequality in urban areas, dust storm monitoring capabilities with Tempo, and also short term analyzing short term public health outcomes using that hourly gaseous pollutant information from Tempo. And I uh, have a QR codes here. You can scan those to actually join our early adopter program here. And you can find much more details on these different early adopter studies in our Tempo green paper here through this QR code. And my contact information is there at the bottom left. Feel free to email me on Tempo questions. And I do want to mention one more thing as we conclude here. I'll leave this up temporarily. Um, I did mention that we have this Tempo proxy data set, and this data set is available to our uh, Tempo science team and Tempo early adopters, and this is through NASA Earth Data Search. I just want to quickly show, you know, the ability for me to go in here and actually download these pre-launch Tempo proxy data sets. We have the Tempo formaldehyde, uh, NO2, and ozone profile products currently available in this NASA Earth Data Search, and you can kind of just play around with it, download them, learn how Tempo data will be served up to the community after launch, and I will end there. And bring this screen back up briefly if you wanted to get those QR codes off there. Thanks, Aaron. That was great. Um, so uh, now I think uh, we finished, uh, completed the presentation part of today's uh, session and we will move to question answer session and uh, for that we will share all the questions which you have been putting in the question section uh, if you have still some questions uh, please do uh, put that in question section so that we can take them one by one uh, so i believe uh, selvin you're going to share your question answer okay here it is okay so what we are going to do is uh, you will see on your screen uh, are people able to see the question answers on their screen is the screen shared selvin yes it is okay great thank you so we will uh, put all the questions here and this uh, sheet we will answer one by one and then this sheet uh, once we proofread it will be uh, put on our website for any further uh, uh, reading people who wants to uh, either look at the recordings or see this uh, question answer refer want to refer this question answer sketch okay so question one uh, why is the polar orbit different in every season what parameter can be affected by the polar orbiting of satellite so i think uh, when you talk about different seasons as polar uh, uh, so the polar orbits are circular orbit along the pole so they just rotate pole to pole and different part of the earth comes underneath the satellite 
and whatever parts of Earth is coming underneath the satellite over uh, orbit will be measured or taken the measurement from that part. Now, as you know, the uh, since Earth is tilted, uh, that is that is what caused the season. And in different season, different parts, different area of the Earth will come into uh, into to the orbit into the overpass of uh, polar orbit satellites. And that is why you will see a difference in uh, uh, coverage in different season. In a way, uh, for it specifically to the air quality related, uh, you will notice that when you are talking about the aerosols measurements, they are taken during only cloud-free conditions and snow and ice-free conditions. So during winter time, during northern hemisphere winter northern latitude location like europe canada they will have all ice covered and the aerosols observation in those locations will not be available uh, similarly in the southern hemisphere same thing happens during their winter time so you will notice change in uh, atmospheric aerosols or air quality related uh, product coverage changes because snow and ice coverage changes uh, in different seasons and same, the cloud also uh, has uh, some seasonal cycles in some, certain part of the country. For example, over Asia, over Indian Ocean, or over India, there are monsoon season during which we don't have any uh, good coverage of aerosol measurements because of the uh, cloudy season. So, based on the uh, for the air, air quality relevant answer. Okay. Question two: Is the reflectivity of dust or smoke influenced by climate? And if so, then what is the best possible geostage platform to be used to identify it? Okay, I'm not very sure about this question, but the reflectivity of dust and smoke does get influenced by the underlying surface on which, uh, uh, where the smoke and dust are uh, have in the atmosphere, right? Uh, their reflectivity or the scattering properties also change how big they are in size and what is their chemical composition the smoke in different uh, 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 over the time smoke can edge actually and can mix with other types of particles and that can change their scattering and absorption properties similar things happen with the dust dust which transported to the long distance they are typically fine dust and they have a little bit different uh, uh, optical properties compared to the uh, larger coarse particles of the dust. So anything in terms of the climate, uh, climate, when we say climate change, we are typically talking about the rainfalls, the uh, temperatures, the relative humidity, and those parameters can also actually impact some of the scattering properties of these particles. So uh, for example, under relative humidity condition, although smoke is not influenced, but if you have absorbed uh, hygroscopic particles, right, uh, like urban aerosols, then they can grow in size uh, under high relative humidity condition, and that can influence the uh, properties. Now, currently, uh, the from the geostationary platform goes the ABI and AHI, uh, and then uh, GEMS and Tempo, they are the best, some of the best uh, or available uh, uh, missions in which you can use, from which you can use uh, data to identify smoke and dust and other types of particles. And we will learn a little bit more about in, uh, in GEMS in session three, uh, which has uh, different, which make measurements in different part of the solar spectrum, which is UV, uh, similar to what you learn from uh, tempo mission, which uh, Aaron was describing earlier. Okay, question three, what useful things can we get from GST satellite during nighttime? Okay, so nighttime, uh, during nighttime, uh, we can actually, uh, if you are looking into visible uh, imageries, then night lights intensity can be measured and that can provide actually uh, useful information about human activities uh, and human presence or, uh, all around the world. Uh, there are also infrared channels uh, which can actually used, can be used uh, during nighttime uh, to actually measure the temperatures uh, 
and brightness temperature and that provides useful information. The clouds can also be monitored during nighttime using the infrared channels. Uh, you can also monitor fog. Uh, you can also actually do uh, volcanic eruption monitoring during nighttime uh, using infrared channels. Uh, so typically there are a range of channels, but the, most of the visible channels does not provide um, a measurement during night except the night lights or the uh, illumination from the moon sometimes. Okay, uh, so there is a question, is there a simple explanation of what is average in kernel? Although we did not talk about this in today's presentation, so I will leave that question uh, for part two and part three when it is more relevant to answer that question. So we will get to that question in part three mostly when it is more relevant actually. Okay, question number five. Is there an archive of GOES image in data somewhere? I want to see data more than a week old, for example, from 200. Yes. So the GOES uh, 1617 image, uh, again, uh, GOES series of satellites is uh, managed and operated by NOAA. So they do have a different uh, archive. Uh, one of the link is provided here in the document. Uh, in week two, the part two, uh, we will go over some of this uh archive and try to download the data uh, using python script so please stay tuned for the next presentation uh, by dr emiha what is the full range of data observation frequencies from goes our satellite so there are three which i mentioned earlier in the presentations the 10 minutes uh 30 second or one minute and then you have five minute conus observation those are default but in addition to those there are other uh, modes uh, which can be operated time to time uh, and they are more like a flex mode so you can have entire uh, full disk every five minutes uh, or you can have a continuous um, continuous measurement of full disk um, every five minutes or in those scenarios you do not have actually conus or mesoscale observation so again in part two when we talk specifically about level two products we will talk about more uh, in details what additional uh, modes are available in from the GOSA. Again, in the script, we have provided a link uh, to get you more details on if you are interested in all the different modes in which GOSA satellite can operate. Is there a cutoff date for historical data in Worldview? So the Worldview, uh, it depends on the satellite for which you are actually accessing the data the modis satellite uh, which provides rgb image the first one was launched in 1999 on terra uh, so the data is available uh, february 2000 onward from modis terra from modis aqua uh, 2002 or 2003 onward uh, veers data has started populating more recently so they are available from 2000 12 onwards from various NPV. So depending on the satellite and sensors, the data will have different uh, availability in the world view differently. Okay, question eight. I recently made a time lapse of Hurricane Ian over Florida with GO 16 full disk data. I use the band as follows. C3, green, C1. What kind of different band composition can I use when I try different band, it gave me error, okay. I'm not sure where you tried and what kind of error you got, but just to give you a uh, quick overview, you can actually, when we loading those three images, RGB in RGB band, we see a true color image, but you can actually change the order of RGB and then you can get a different color combination. So it depends on what kind of features you're trying to highlight and based on that, you can actually change the order or you can change the channel itself to actually uh, have a different uh, color scheme or different features highlighted in your image. For example, um, when we do land surface uh, vegetation uh, display, uh, typically we actually, in case of Modis, uh, we load the band seven in red and then, then uh, band two in green and then blue in band one and that gives you a different color combination so because the vegetation is very reflective in near infrared which is band two uh, you uh, 
and then absorption happens in band and band seven, you will see a greenish color of vegetation in that particular. And similarly, brownish colors of the land, which is uh, very bright in the uh, red color. So depending on what feature you want to highlight, you can make your own color combination. And those are called false colors composite image, false color composite image, because you are actually loading different color scheme rather than RGB in that order. So uh, that is one uh, possibility to uh, use a different color combination to get uh, to, to actually highlight certain features in a uh, satellite image. Is there any data source which can give the option to download the data in Excel or CSV format from NASA Worldview? Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, NASA Worldview does not allow data to download uh, uh, in Excel or CSV. What NASA Worldview is does is provides a link to the original NASA Earth data uh, where you can download the data either in NetCDF format or HDF format or HDF5 format. Uh, there are some other uh, uh, sources, for example, level three data, which are gridded um, from geo one I believe can be uh, downloaded in some cases in CSV format. Question number 10. If people want to use this data for machine learning models and data science projects with data format, should they be familiar with what and what tools are needed for Python users. So I mentioned earlier, these data comes uh, in HDF and NetCDF data format. These are the two most common uh, data format in which satellite data, most of the satellite data are provided. Uh, some satellite data are also provided in GeoTIFF uh, also, but most of them are in HDF and NetCDF. Python can handle both of these. Uh, there are specific package in Python uh, which can handle these data sets. So if, uh, if, if, if there is an advanced Python user, they should be able to actually uh, read and map and uh, extract the data from this format. Now, specifically for air quality data in part two and part three, both will have a component uh, where we are going to actually take some of this level two data file and read, map, and extract the data using some of the example Python code. So we will go through some of those exercise uh, in part two and part three. Okay, uh, question 11. Does a geostationary satellite have NRT bin speed data? If it does, uh, can you provide me the link to the data? Yes. So there is a level two derived motion winds uh, from GOES-R satellites. The link, uh, the data is available uh, from Na uh, NOAA, uh, NASDAQ, Star NASDAQ websites. And some of the link how to access the data are again available in the script, which we are, uh, you can see here on your screen. And this will be provided through our website later on to all the participants. So you will be able to access those links. We will do, um, like I said, we will go through download process of level two data using Python script in next week's presentation um, by Dr. Amy Hub. And uh, she, she will show you how to download and that should be able to easily, you should be able to easily modify those script for wind data, uh, which are originally written for aerosol data. Okay, question 12, what does Z mean? This was asked when the volcano GIF was being created. Okay, Z means, uh, so this is a, uh, since most of the satellite data are uh, uh, global data sets uh, and you need a constant, uh, a constant time zone to represent the data. So we typically use 24 hour time called Zulu time. That's what the Z stand for. And this is typically, UTC or GMT time, it represents Z means represent UTC time or GMT time. So most of the satellite data are reported actually in UTC and the G Z comes from there. Okay, question 13, how can you measure the coverage, for example, of that volcano, either width or depth? Okay, so this is an interesting question and I, 
it it depends on what, what how you want to do it right so in terms of if you want to do the vertical profile of the volcano or the height then you need uh, uh, the imager measurement may not be uh, best to use it uh, either you need a uh, sensor which has capability to do uh, multi-angle uh, viewing of the same location uh, for example miser uh, or you need a uh, sensors or something which can have active sensors for example lidar uh, like a calypso or a um, uh, radar uh, based uh, instrument which can actually uh, penetrate through those thick clouds and give you a vertical profiles and that will enable you to how to uh, do the depth uh, in terms of the width, I think the width uh, you can do calculate based if you take the original image and first you detect the uh, boundaries of the volcano and then you can calculate actually as time passes how the width or the you know, parameter of that volcanic eruption is uh, changing over time. Um, since each pixel had fixed uh, 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 size on the surface of the earth, you can actually convert that into either area or width or some kind of a other kind of di dimension. Uh, it is a it's it's not something readily available. Uh, you you will have to do uh, manually, uh, and there are tools actually which uh, can allow you to do that. Some some of the image processing tools uh, like ArcGIS or other uh, which which might be allowed to do this kind of using level one V images. Okay, question 14, how do I activate the time hours and minutes on the world view? I only see year, month and date. Okay, so this happens uh, when you, by default, uh, world view displays only MODIS and VIRS data as base layer. And since I mentioned MODIS and VIRS data only available one or two measurements per day, uh, you do not see the time there. As soon as you load uh, any geostationary data like GOES or Himawari, uh, the time, uh, hour and minutes start appearing in the uh, times on the bottom bar. Um, as soon as you remove those two layers uh, from geostationary, that hourly window, the time and uh, minutes and hour options will go away from world view. Okay, so the question 15, um, in 16, uh, 17, uh, I believe. Uh, Aaron, do you want to take those three questions? Uh, sure. And for 15, definitely averaging kernels are critical to the ozone profile retrieval, and that averaging kernel information will be in the ozone profile product. And in fact, that's already in our pre launch proxy product for folks to go take a look at that I showed on Earth data earlier. So um, the pre-launch proxy products were created and made to have all the pertinent variables already in the file for users to browse and access. Uh, Intrusion kernels are critical. Uh, for Tempo 16, the well, is chemistry products available in units of PB are for the level products like NO2, SO2, will be available in molecules per centimeter squared. Um, the units for those level two, level three products. Um, now, the ability is for users to go in there and convert those products to like a PPM, I mean a PPV. Uh, and our, our ozone profile will be available in Dobson units. So those are our standard unit output for our air quality products from Tempo. Can you read the 17 and then answer it, please? Yeah, I was going to wait for uh, whoever's typing to catch up. But yeah, um, so question 17, does Tempo cover other parts of the world? Uh, no. So Tempo will cover greater northern app during my presentation. However, that being said, uh, you know, Pawan also mentioned on this uh, air quality constellation. And that will include the mission, essentially our sister mission of Tempo uh, with similar observing capabilities. 
as Tempo, which will cover Asia. And we'll also have, uh, I think they're still planning on launching the European Sentinel-4 satellite in 2024, which will cover North Africa and Europe. So we'll have a really nice uh, kind of global air quality constellation that will cover a large portion of North America, or not North America, North, the Northern Hemisphere for users. So, and um, that's really going to be the great aspect of this global air quality constellation. I lost question 18. There we go. Okay. Why is the resolution different for ozone profile and aerosol? Okay. This is tempo here too. For the ozone profile, there is a lot of noise in that. It's a very no noisy retrieval when done at the tempo footprint, nominal footprint location size of two by 4.75 kilometers squared. So in order to kind of hit our baseline mission requirements on the accuracy requirements of that ozone profile product, we do some co-adding, it's called co-adding, essentially averaging of tempo footprints to uh, increase the signal to noise ratio and ultimately increase the accuracy levels of that product for the community. So that's kind of why the ozone profile is currently specified at eight by 4.75 kilometers squared, rather than at the tempo nominal footprint size of two by 4.75 kilometers squared. Uh, for aerosol, um, kind of a similar concept there. However, you did see in our product list that I shared, we are looking at a GOES R tempo synergistic aerosol product which will have higher resolution aerosol information. And we're looking at a potential a resolution spatially of that product at two by two kilometers squared currently. So uh, some of this is still kind of TBD and we're looking at this now during the pre-launch mission. So probably more to come there and more updates on that aerosol product. Okay, question 19. Can I detect emissions of NOx from Tempo? For sure, you know, Tempo will provide column, tropospheric column layer of information on your nitrogen dioxide. However, you know, that gives insight into these areas of NOx emissions across the Tempo field of regard. Of course, there's extra steps and procedures that are needed to, you know, get at the NOx emissions, but it can definitely identify areas of NOx emissions through that diurnally, you know, you know, our hourly NO2 product from Tempo that will have that information from morning to evening across a Tempo field of regard. It's one of the key aspects of Tempo actually is the capability to monitor emissions from the morning to evening compared to our current low Earth orbiters that are only focused on those midday hours. Um, question 20 might be just a general question for Paul and two. Yeah, so question 20 is can we monitor and analyze hydrometeorological hazard using GSTS satellite data? Yes, answer is yes. I mean, we do that all the time. We measure, we do typhoons, hurricanes, uh, thunderstorms, all those are hydrometeorological phenomena which we always um, actually monitor using geostationary data. Uh, in fact, that is one of the primary use of geostationary, uh, meteorological geostationary data. How is the pre-launch data generated by Tempo and are those actual measurements in the data? Okay, Aaron, this is your question. Did a whole presentation on this. Um, in brief, what we do, you know, don't just, don't focus on the accuracy level of the products. We use model input information. Um, yeah, so hopefully that answers that question. Um, there is a link. I presented more information on this during some of our Tempo early adopter workshops. So I could share that link um, to those presentations for more information on the pre-launch product generation. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron. 
So uh, since we are already two over and five minutes, I'm going to just take the last question here, the 22, and then we will uh, we will actually post all the answers of all the remaining questions in written uh, through this script uh, later on uh, on through our website. So question 22, how can I get the level two and level three data from GS2 satellite? So uh, simply just uh, say stay tuned for part two uh, and we will learn about how we get these uh, data sets. And with that, thank you everyone for joining today's uh, webinar series, uh, first part of the series. Next week, we have specifically guest speaker, Dr. Amy Huff, who will present on GOES, uh, our series of data, uh, specifically related to air quality. And then we'll play with some Python codes uh, to download and visualize the data. Thanks everyone. Thank, thank you, Aaron, for presenting. Thank you. Bye-bye.